great to be here to talk to you about responsive AI and here at the uh, UCLA Innovation Day. Um, so before I jump into the topic, maybe just a little bit about me and my background. Um, I'm in the Google Cloud office of the CTO, focusing on AI and analytics. And uh, you know, my background, I've been involved in one way or another in this, in this field of artificial intelligence uh, throughout my career. I studied math and computer science undergraduate at, at McGill. I went on to study computer science at MIT and you know, started off working in artificial intelligence around clinical decision making. That software engineering was a, a more practical thing, and spent time, you know, as, as a co-founder, CTO of an internet company that we created out of the entrepreneurship competition at MIT. Um, we got back into big data and machine learning uh, at a company called Quantcast, where I ran engineering and machine learning. Started my own uh, company to help enterprises with big data and AI called Think Big Analytics. Uh, we were acquired by Teradata, where I led that uh, as a business unit. Started an AI incubator and then came over to Google because I was so excited by the rapid advances in AI, but also the importance of thinking about like how do we make AI land in a really positive way in our society, and that's a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about here today, um, because I think um, AI driven by the advances in machine learning is having a tremendous amount of positive impact in the world, but it, but the impact is also tremendous and it's not all positive, right? And we really have to think about it and think about how to get it right. So, you know, I'm going to talk today is going to start off with an overview, including, you know, what's going on in AI, quick recap, um, what, what, why is it so exciting, right? But then also, what are some examples where we have problems? What are some of the challenges that we see when people are applying AI that we should be thinking about? How are we uh, thinking about responsible practices at Google and, and elsewhere, right? What are ways of adopting the technology in a, a positive way? And then some conclusions. So to start with, there's the promise of AI. I think it's worth looking. This decade, in particular, right, for teens, um, have been a tremendous in terms of the pace of advance. Right at the start of this decade, the kinds of things that uh, we were able to do uh, with computers in terms of AI were so much more limited than what we can do now. Right. So just as a quick tour through, you look at the kinds of things that we figured out how to do really well. Right. The ability to do things like take images and figure out what's in them. Uh, the ability to take sound and be understanding what someone is saying, whether it be more advanced things like you know, translating languages from one language to another, or even more complicated things like labeling an image. Like a computer can now pretty accurately describe, hey, there's a cheetah lying on top of a car. None of this was commercially useful at the start of the day. Right? It's all developed very rapidly. Uh, just to drive it home, at the start of the decade, um, in computer vision, a, a, a competition uh, called ImageNet, a challenge problem had been created to say how, how good a job can a computer do with recognizing the object in an image from a large data set on the internet. And uh, people, it's not trivial, like you have to be able to distinguish among multiple degrees of wrong, and you know, there's a 5% error rate in figuring out this, this challenge when we try to do it. Um, the last time before this new technique using Neural networks or deep learning was really working well. Um, people were using a bunch of tricks with uh, coming up with hand engineered features like, oh, can I see lines in this and lose contrast and so forth. And, and the kinds of algorithms for identifying objects had a 26% error rate in 2011. Five years later, superhuman performance, 3% error rate. Huge difference, right? Um, and, and this kind of progress in AI has landed commercially in a variety of areas. Now, I would say digital companies like Google have been at the forefront and ahead of many industries in this space. But when you when you look at the, the range of applications, I'm not going to go into all of them, but whether it be delightful new experiences like the Google Assistant you can run on your phone or smart speakers, a Google Home, right? The, the, this kind of thing, uh, you, you couldn't have an effective interface for talking at a computer and having it respond in a useful way that people liked, right? If you were like me, uh, uh, a few years ago, and you call up and you have a computer talk to you, your reaction is like, get me out of here, I want to talk to a human being. I, this is terrible, right? Now we're happily, like my kids at home will happily have the Google Home be the DJ and play music and, you know, settle disputes at dinner around, hey Google, you know, who is the, uh, you know, what, what, what is the population of City X, right? So, 
we've been able to use some of this AI to create those types of delightful experiences. You know, continues to do things like improve accuracy and search results for Google, as well as all kinds of new things. Even little things like, who here has tried using uh, Gmail and it and use its suggestion of how to complete emails, right? I mean, it's pretty helpful, right? It's smart enough to, to say useful things that can make your life more productive, right? So there's a whole range of things, right? And broadly across Google's business, whether it be consumer-facing things or things like smart bidding for ads in the business-to-business -business context, it's having a big impact on Google's products. It's also, you know, really applicable. Like, the, there's a lot. If you in 2008, they had published out the grand engineering challenges from the 21st century, and you know, the ones in red are ones where Google is actively doing work on tackling these challenges. And across the board, you know, their machine learning is playing an important role, right? So it's it's having a chance to have a big impact on a lot of really critical problems in our society. You know, taking a very specific example of a, of a big problem in, in the field of healthcare, there's tons of interesting applications. One, diabetic, diabetic retinopathy is a disease that can cause blindness. Um, you know, there's over 400 million people worldwide with diabetes, and um, it turns out that you know if you don't if you don't do the right screening, people who have diabetes can develop this condition and go blind. And in fact, in India, um, almost half of patients who get diabetic retinopathy um, do lose their eyesight before they're diagnosed. And and in in tandem with that, right, you have the shortage because of the rural nature of the country and and um, not enough trained eye doctors, there's you know significant shortage, right? So it's a big problem in, in third world countries. I mean, it's not just in third world countries, but it, it significant, uh, significant loss for people, right? So this is an example where uh, Google has invested in building uh, algorithms that can take out of an image of a person's eye and now actually achieve um, accuracy, uh, competitive, not just with general doctors, but actually uh, better results than ophthalmologists achieve, right, at diagnosing this condition, right? And so what, what that means is, um, you know, it's undergoing clinical trials so that it can be used as a screening tool so somebody who's in a rural area in a third world country can see, hey, am I at risk of this condition and go get treatment if they if they have it, right? So it can make a big difference. So, that, so just one example, there's lots of other cases where people are applying machine learning to addressing critical health conditions, and you know, generally with a the theme of, hey, this is an area that can really augment and help um, physicians do a better job of treating uh, people. You know, in another area, um, if you think about it, uh, Google started a lot of the excitement around self-driving cars with what was the Google self-driving car project. Now it's a company called Waymo that's part of the, the corporate parent of Google Alphabet. Um, and there's a ton of machine learning that goes into this. First of all, just recognizing in, in the sensor input, video and LIDAR, what's going on in the environment is a lot of machine learning. So is path planning and figuring out what to do. Um, and, and so, you know, in addition to having driven, you know, over 8 million physical miles, there's thousands of times more miles driven in simulation. Um, and, and so it's a very sophisticated system, but it uses a lot of machine learning as you'd expect, a lot of artificial intelligence techniques. Um, and it turns out that and this is also, a, you know, I think sometimes we get too hung up on things like, is this a perfect technology, right? So there have been, there's some concerns around, you know, how do we get to a level of safety that we're happy with? But um, does anybody know how many people every year die in automobile accidents? 80,000? 32,000 in the US. How about worldwide? It's about a million. There's a lot of people die in auto accidents worldwide. The US is a lot safer than other parts of the world, it turns out. So, you know, it's a pretty serious problem, right? And um, annually, yeah. So, so it's a big, you know, so, so improving, creating a safer driver, improving the safety on the roads is a, it, you know, could have a big impact on society. Even, even, uh, even in first world countries where uh, things are safer, right? So it's another area where I think machine learning can have a real positive impact. Um, you know, and I think may maybe a useful thing to think about too, though, is 
with all of this positive, um, it's also worth understanding that like any powerful new technology, it, ha it can have a big impact on society and th there's a journey to responsibility. So some of what I'm gonna talk about in terms of well, what's responsible AI um, can, will connect with uh, any technology and a, and a good one because I think it, it, it comes to mind um, and, and has some similarities is think about the journey of automotive, right? The deployment of automotive technology, right? Where um, you know, some of the key turning points in, in automotive. When, when automobiles first came out, they were hailed actually as a, a wonderful improvement in the environment, right? Because if you lived in a crowded city where horse travel was the primary form of travel, there were tremendous disease problems and pollution problems. And automobiles were a wonderful innovation for cleaning up the city, believe it or not, even though we find that hard to believe today that an internal combustion engine would do that, right? Um, but at the same time, right, safety was not, uh, was not initially a big priority in deploying automobiles, and there were some real design flaws, right? And so we all, we all know about uh, the, the movement Ralph Nader and others did around advocating for designing safety into automobiles and having more responsibility, which added cost, but it ended up producing some significant benefits. And likewise, you know, really starting to drive standards around uh, auto efficiency and, and reducing pollution, changing the, uh, you know, regulating um, the fuel that was used, right? So, uh, and ultimately driving to more clean usage. Um, I, I'm gonna go with the assumption that uh, push back against some of these later things is uh, more of a blip in the road and not a long-term trend in our society. But the point being that, um, you know, the, there, were a, there have been a tremendous amount of benefit to our society from adopting this technology, but we had to think about and implement policies to curb some of the downsides and to, to get more of the upside, right? So that's true in any major and powerful technology. And, you know, it's not on here, but of course, um, there are there are all kinds of uses, right? People have applied internal combustion engines to build tanks and to, for military applications, and it's been used by repressive regimes to do awful things, right? So technology is is a tool and can be used for good and bad, right? And and so in, in a, there's a natural parallel with AI technologies that they're a powerful tool that can be used for a variety of things. And I think we have to in this talk, I'm going to talk about sort of what are some of the consequences, things that we should be worried about. How do we emphasize the good. Um, I think one of the one of the things that uh, are a couple of things that are a little different than than some of the other technologies is the pace that things is happening in is faster, right? So things seem to be moving in a, a quicker rate. And so it's harder for us to kind of get our head around policy ramifications. And also if you automate things, it's it's sometimes harder for people to notice what's going on versus processes where lots of people are involved and it's a lot easier for somebody to flag and say, hey, here's a concern. So what are some of the kinds of things that we see that, that can be problems? One that, one that comes up and it has gotten a lot of attention, rightly so, is, is bias, right? Systems that, that have unfair bias towards certain groups, certain types of users. Um, another one is cases where technologies are, are put out, but there isn't enough control around how it responds. Uh, I think a third is, um, and really thinking about how it has a longer term impact or broader impact on society rather than on individuals. And then lastly, you know, what is the impact on users themselves over the longer term, right? So, so let's, let's unpack this and talk about a few examples of these. So a couple of types of bias. One is disproportionate performance, which means that uh, the system worked well for some classes of users better than others. Um, the other is representational harms, which is about, um, basically doing things that, that will be offensive or, or you know, portray a certain class of users in a way that, that is uh, unacceptable, right? So an example of disproportionate performance, uh, this is a AI system. Uh, there's a, a system for predicting if a criminal is likely to recommit a crime, recidivism, right? It's used for parole decisions in many jurisdictions in the country called Compass. It's a commercial system. It's fairly complicated, um, and uh, part of the commercial model of the, the vendor, of course, is to, to not have too much transparency because they want to retain their IP. Um, unfortunately, uh, the data shows that, uh, like in this example, where you have a white man who's committed prior offenses, they're pretty serious. The system felt he was at low risk of reoffending, was granted parole, and went on to commit another serious offense. 
this African American woman who had a, a series of smaller misdemeanors um, was predicted to be high risk, even though she did not reoffend. Right, and it turns out this this example is representative of a systematic flaw in the system that you had a much a uh, higher proportion of African Americans labeled high risk who didn't reoffend, and whites who were labeled low risk who did reoffend. So a biased system with disproportionate performance, and that that's that's troubling because of course uh, a parole decision is a pretty major impact on a person's life, and getting it wrong in a, in a racially biased way is unacceptable, right? But um, so so that's one example that of you know getting having bias go wrong. In a similar way, another kind of disproportionate uh, performance um, is in, uh, and this got converted from uh, Google Slides to PowerPoint and got uh, botched, but <laughs> consumer lending discrimination, right? So even correcting for um, other confounding variables, um, this analysis shows that you still have uh, Latinx and African American uh, loan applicants for new purchases facing about eight basis points in interest rate discrimination and about half that in refinancing, you know, which doesn't sound like a huge number, but it's still, in aggregate, almost a billion dollars a year that's being spent extra uh, in discriminatory interest uh, because of racial bias um, in, in uh, lending models, right? Recent work out of UC Berkeley. So, you know, so these are examples of cases, you know, racial bias is one example. Of course, there's other kinds of bias that, that make their way in. I don't have the slide on it, but uh, Amazon shelved a, a employment system they were using that was gender biased, that, that was uh, predisposed to perhaps feeding in the, the, the prior that they were hiring more men than women for roles. And so it, it learned that men were better candidates than women and discriminated against women. So they had to shelve it. Another kind of bias. Um, uh, in terms of uh, you know re representational harms, so th this is an interesting uh, example um, that uh, w a a another uh, sibling company in Google um, to Google called Jigsaw, which is about building tools to help foster healthy conversations online. It has a model for predicting toxicity, which is to basically say, hey when we want to moderate discussions online, we want to tell if people are, are being offensive or being rude or, or et cetera. But, but a thing came up pretty quickly when this model came out is people noticed that, um, that certain phrases uh, uh, where protected groups are being um, used as an insulting term were being per perceived as toxic. Um, much more so than the opposite, right? So like in this example, saying I am straight was viewed as, as unlikely to be toxic, but saying I am gay was perceived as likely to be toxic because of the use of that term as, as an insult, right? And that's a representational harm, right? And in fact, there were a lot of work went into like figuring out how do you build a model so that you don't <laughs> come up with this outcome and fix this problem, but it's an example of the kind of problem that, that can occur, right? And, and this was not, this was not, you know, there were a variety of things went into fixing it, but the point is like there, there was no intention to create this kind of discrimination in either, any of these cases, right? But it came out and it's important to be aware that these kind of things can happen, right? Another example, and, and this is more in, in the realm of insufficient controls, right? And, and there can be a lot of cases where people, if they're not cautious or careful about you know, how do you defend, ensure your system has good performance, have the right controls, um, bad things can happen. So, uh, example, um, does anybody remember uh, Microsoft Tay? It was a, a short-lived chat bot that went live on Twitter and responded to people. And, um, and what happened was a, a bunch of uh, racists went about training it to become a racist. And, and they got to be, they, they very quickly got it to do that. I, I didn't want to include, you can look this up online if you want to see the awful things it said in the short time it was around before it was taken down. But, um, you know, I would argue that this is an example of not having put enough controls in the system and not thought through adversarial modes. Like, assuming that everyone interacting with you has good intention and shares your values is a dangerous assumption, right? And, and in this case, um, you know, significant, you know, there was some, some, some meaningful harm done, you know. So how do you build safeguards? Um, 
it's a good question, and, and we'll talk about it because it's not like, there's not a simple, like, here's a fix, but it's like, if you're gonna put a general thing online to do conversation, you have to think about it because the, the naive thing, this is a, a very likely outcome, right? You know, in a similar way, you know, we see things like, what, what, what is the impact on society of, um, there have been a number of cases where uh, content online um, has been amplified by recommendation algorithms, right? Because uh, machine learning algorithms that predict, like, what are you interested in? Two things happen, right? One is inflammatory and extremist content tends to drive more interest than reflective, subtle reason content. And, uh, and you know, truth is not often a, a huge <laughs> factor in, in, in that response, right? So uh, just as an example of how this can have an impact on society, um, the rise of vaccine hesitancy has now emerged to be one of the top 10 threats to global health, uh, according to the World Health Organization. You know, and you know, I would argue that a lot of that has been amplification by online channels where, you know, this is, be again, an example of, okay, people are now starting to realize this and, and have done a lot to correct and say, hey, we shouldn't be boosting and recommending, you know, conspiracy theories and false statements. Like, that's, a, that's a bad news. But, you know, it's an example of what goes wrong when you're not thoughtful. This is one of the 10 threats to global health. Um, I, I don't remember, I might have been seventh, um, but, but still, I mean, the, the fact that, that this, this <laughs> you know, that, that it's risen to that level that World Health Organization puts it in the top 10 is pretty alarming. You know, in, in a similar way, um, and in, in a similar way, um, you think about uh, impact on users, uh, things like you know, Cambridge Analytica, lots goes in. There's some, there's some questions around control and, and influence on people, but uh, you know, the, the ability to manipulate people through online algorithms you know, is part of the, the story of Cambridge Analytica. Um, you know, I think a lot of people would agree that, uh, that, that, um, that there's, a lot, there's a lot to unpack there, right? So like, how are we interacting with users? How are we using their data? How are we... Um, what, what are we doing to sort of get them to do things? Like a, a, a core part of a, a, a lot of Cambridge Analytica's approach in uh, manipulating campaigns was to, uh, to tilt the scales where one class of users would be uh, gotten into a, a mode of anger and responsiveness, another one to apathy and non-participation, right? And like in a close election, if you can have one side be motivated and other side apathetic, you can tilt the scales, right? And that's clearly a case of manipulating users against their interests. Uh, and, and more generally, I think you see is that, that what happens is that these are examples of unintended consequences, right? That in, in most cases, I mean, clearly there, there are bad actors out there that have ill intent, but, but let's talk about responsible organizations that have good intent. Uh, unintended consequences is, are common. Machine learning, part of the thing that's tricky is it's not like engineering a system where you design the results for, you know, very carefully from the beginning and know exactly what's gonna happen. You allow it to, to learn from data and you, you, you really have a hard time predicting, right? So understanding what's going on, uh, you know, figuring out like in, from a complex systems perspective what can happen can be challenging. And there can be feedback loops, right? Things can work well and then suddenly new behavior emerges and uh, you run into new challenges. Right, so these are some of the challenges that, are, that arise and why responsible AI is important. So what can we do? I, I think you know, there's, there's a few things. One is starting with the foundation of having clear principles around what you believe is an organization, around AI, what's important to you, right? Then, then governance, right? It's like, like many other areas in an organization, if, if something's important, you need to put, build in governance, yeah. So, I, I, so the question is, you know, is, is this a concern for, for example, companies or should it be societal? And I, I think it has to be both because I think, um, you know, fundamentally I believe that uh, 
uh, that that companies have a responsibility to all their stakeholders, right? And they're not solely responsible for shareholder profit, um, but but that also I think that uh, a prudent company would have enlightened self-interest to to get ahead of responsible AI because a you know increasingly companies are being held accountable um, for irresponsible action, right? The, the, the excuse of like, hey, we didn't see this coming. We had no idea that bad things could happen. You know, that might have worked in past, but I think that that's wearing thin. And I, I think, you know, you're, but I also agree that at some level, we do want to have standards and regulation. I think, I think it's also an important reason why companies should be getting ahead of this and thinking about what the right way to do it is so they can influence that to have kind of the, the most positive and the least negative outcomes. Um, but you know, you're starting to see things like the European Union has published guidelines on trustworthy AI, right? Which is, to my knowledge, the first case of a, of a specifically AI-focused initiative saying, hey, how do we think about regulating rather than you know, privacy and data governance, which is a, obviously a bigger topic in a lot of jurisdictions. But I think, I think it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's a good question. I mean, I'd say Google certainly is doing it, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, you know, I see a lot of other companies that are, are, for example, joining consortia, like the Partnership on AI. Um, but, but I think it's, uh, it's definitely a rubber meets the road moment, right? I'd, I'd say in a similar way, you know, Google invested in privacy governance um, starting about 10 years ago, and, and you know, put it, baking it in, like when you build products, you need to think about privacy, and and you know. But I'd say, you know, there's, there's obvious analogies in other industries, right? Like um, in financial services, risk governance is built in, right? You have a team that's responsible for measuring and, and holding accountability for risk because it's so critical to the business, right? I'd say that as increasingly companies are investing in AI, they need to be thinking about AI governance in the same way. Yeah, no, I, I, if, if you take away from that saying, like, what should we do in AI governance, then, then I hope the talk's been a worthwhile one for you because I think it's really important, right? I mean, maybe the principles aren't um, as controversial, I think. Put aside, these are things maybe Google-specific, right? You know, you, you could argue, like, hey, some companies are building weapon systems and it's perfectly valid, right? Like, we need to allow our military to to have uh, kind of competitive weapons. I, I don't like the idea of an AI-driven arms race, but, but let's put aside you know, Google's specific things that we, we're doing, but, but you know, these things like socially beneficial, you know, avoiding bias, being safe and accountable, incorporating privacy design, upholding scientific excellence and used for, for relevant purposes, those are probably not too controversial, right? I think it's, it connects in, in a meaningful way though with Another thread, which is you think about long-term interests of users, um, you know, we have our digital well-being values, which are, are around like, how do we give users control over technology and make things explicit, right? Like, that can be small things like, now on YouTube, you can turn off autoplay, right? If you don't want to be just like sucked into the next video and the next video, right? Um, so giving people a level of control of the experience and earning trust, I think they're really important because uh, I think there's fair criticism that often uh, driving kind of short-term financial benefits in, from machine learning, you know, attention economy uh, is actually harming long-term interest of users, right? So giving them more explicit control over what they want and, and allowing that to be baked in to the models is important. So I think those, these values are that's often talked about when it comes to AI. This is not just an AI problem, it's also a, a design problem, right? Uh, I think that the, the Stanford Center for Addictive Design <laughs> Or persuasive design renamed themselves recently. They didn't call themselves addictive ever, but persuasive, right? They changed their name. Um, so some thoughts about governance, right? I mean, in some sense, you know, it's it's about having the right uh, the right groups of people. I, I think the big thing that I see is so many organizations feel like uh, this is complicated. This is technical. It should only be governed and sort of be be looked at by the technical experts. And if there's anything that I think is is the, the most harmful, it's that view. It's like you can't delegate uh, governance of something with a huge policy impact, business impact, 
just to the technical experts. And, and what you tend to see happen go wrong when companies do that, when organizations do that, is you tend to have sort of narrow reductionist views, right? And there's like, a, there's a ton of research on the kind of harmful problems I talked about, and, 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 and which is good. But what you tend to see is, of course, engineers boiling it down to here's a small technical problem I can really clearly define and clearly solve. That's great for publishing a paper. It's great for making progress. But it's a little bit of a cop-out when you think about the big picture, right? Like some of these things are hard to define. So you need to have the involvement, not just of technical experts, but of people like, you know, risk experts, policy experts, user design, you know, user experience, and ways of escalating and operations for how do you bake governance into your processes when you're, you're applying these techniques. You know, and just as a reminder, right, I think that a lot of times people think, well, machine learning is somehow objective and it's, it's not value-based, but humans are involved in all phases of machine learning, right? We're deciding what data sources to use for training models, curating them and, and picking them, and there can be bias built in. We determine what we're evaluating, what we're optimizing for, which is, again, a value-based decision, and we get affected by the results, right? So people are a part of this picture, right? It's, uh, it, it's not right just because it's a technology. Yeah, it's a tool, but it can, it can be used for good and ill, as hopefully I've convinced you from the earlier examples. And, and, and with that, a big part of this is saying, we need a level of understanding of our machine learning models, right? So it's not just enough to have, you know, engineers want to be able to understand models so that they work well and they improve, but domain experts need to have a level of understanding of what's going on in a model so they can govern they can anticipate problems, they can think about the big picture, right? So, you know, you need to have a way of trusting your models and being able to, to serve a variety of purposes. So, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the work to date on understanding models tends to still be pretty low level and not necessarily helpful for that purpose, right? So I think it's even more incumbent to, to have a process of saying, well, if you don't have an automated solution, you still have to have a way to be able to explain what's going on in a model that a non-technical expert can, can understand and have confidence. You know, one of the things, I won't talk about the details, but the, the advent of deep learning networks um, has allowed for better models that are predicting more, but are harder to understand. And there's work that's been done on saying, well, maybe we can have a trade-off of simpler to understand rules or decision trees that work better than traditional techniques but are, are easier to understand and have confidence in, right? And indeed, I think, you know, the good, good, is, good example, professor at Duke University wrote this talking about like, hey, for these high stakes decisions, why are we emphasizing these complicated black box models? Maybe we need simpler things, right? And a good example, the one I showed you before, Compass, with 130 factors, it's hard to understand for predicting, um, Recidivism um, ended up coming with a very simple set of rules that performs just as well, um, in, in which she features in this paper, which I thought was interesting, right? So questioning, do we need the complexity and, 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 and challenging, you know, explainability versus uh, per predictive power is, is, is a trade-off that needs to be made explicitly and not just defaulted to. Another thing super important is to be tracking multiple metrics about whatever is happening, right? So, so track, you know, what are the consequences? We roll this thing out, run a test, you know, see how it affects not just the obvious things, but less obvious things, right? You know, we, other tools we've come up with inside Google for transparency is explicit ways of documenting data so people understand and don't have misunder, you know, how to use and how not to use certain data sets or models to understand their characteristics, again, as a way of communicating to so make it easier for the various stakeholders to do, to make informed decisions. Um, you know, another thing is this idea of secondary models, right? So this idea that uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this, like finding when something goes wrong, like here's an example, right? You've got uh, a conspiracy theory video um, and, you know, a secondary model that recognizes this is generally not factual, and so here's a link to, you know, authoritative scientific resource so you can at least have that available, um, you know, which, which uh, I, I think that's of some use, but I don't think this is the primary way you solve, you know, <laughs> conspiracy theories. I think the primary thing is back to, like, you shouldn't be boosting them and amplifying them with recommendations, right? And indeed, right, so, like, coming up with better ways of Having, this is a big area that 
I, I think there's a lot more just engineering work that has to go into this. Rather than optimizing simple things that are our business objectives, thinking more about you know, how do you come up with objectives that, that, that better reflect your actual values, right? So engineering the values in your machine learning system is, a, is an area I think is incredibly important and uh, will continue to be more important. Um, there's research on sort of long-term ways of coming up with value alignment, but that is much more, that, that's a much longer term project than sort of the practical engineering work of saying we need to have engineering discussions around what are the right objectives, right? So rather than sort of building systems that, that tend to tilt towards bad outcomes and catch the worst outcomes, try to tilt towards good outcomes. So just to conclude, um, you know, we've published out some, some more thoughts, like we have Google Responsible AI practices that identify a number of suggestions and approaches for different stakeholders in terms of how you can think about applying and adopting more responsibility in AI. And, and really the recap I would say is, you know, I'd, I'd say one is to take responsibility and think about how you can start to embrace a responsible approach, what that means in your organization. Think about how to broaden participation so you have the right stakeholders involved and not just technical experts. Think about investing to increase transparency and think about value alignment, how you can drive better alignment of, of your organization's values with what you're doing, right? And, you know, I'd say, um, to, to the earlier question too, it's like the, the best thing to do is to get started, right? To pick some areas where maybe there's more risk in how you're applying machine learning and just think about how you can start to learn and start to build some muscle memory and start to have you know, better oversight of what you're doing. And I think you're going to want that because machine learning is gonna become increasingly important in every industry and it's going to be increasingly central to how business gets done, in my opinion. Um, and so it's really important to start thinking about the right oversight and governance from the start. And the last thing, just a few resources, right? We have Google's published out our People in AI guidebook, which is around human-centric AI design, responsible practices I mentioned, and then this is the EU's ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI, which is an interesting reference as well. So um, with that, uh, I think we're, we're low on time. I don't know if we have time for one or two questions before we wrap up. Yeah. So it's a good question. How do you think about, uh, I mean, I, I think that the question around the, the business practices of partners, uh, it, it, you know, the ethics of those is a broad topic, right? And so AI would fit into that framework, right? In the same way that people have done a lot to think about things like how do you ensure you do business with ethical partners and, and you, you eschew uh, doing business with organizations that are doing things that are, are, are contrary either to the law or to your values, I think a lot of the same practices should apply, right? So, um, you know, I, I would say most organizations are, are, are so nascent now that if you ask them like, well, what are, what, what are your guarantees or what, do you, what, what, what is your process or what's your governance, they would probably look at you and say like, the best case would be like, well, we're a member of this consortium, but, but that doesn't actually guarantee anything, right? So. I think it's a good thing to, to, to say, you know, if there's something where it's sensitive that you, you, you try to put something into the contract that would at least provide some level of guarantee, right? Like around if somebody is collecting data or, or taking action in a certain way that you, you, you require that and you have some teeth. I mean, I would argue that Cambridge Analytica is an example of um, having insufficient controls over downstream use, right? So there's an example where uh, there was too little control over use of data and ultimately uh, led to harmful consequences, right? So I think, I don't think it's, I don't think there's an easy answer, but I think it's an area that people should be thinking more about how to have the right kind of uh, structure in the contracts. Yeah. Yeah, so quantum computing. I mean, I'd say quantum computing definitely um, is is has the potential to create a lot more artificial intelligence capabilities. Um, you know, I think the the kinds of areas where 
today we're seeing results in quantum computing are still fairly narrow kinds of computation, but there's line of sight to applications in artificial intelligence. So I think generally it's going to just create more capability, which makes the technology more powerful, which only just raises the stakes to say it's even more important to think about the consequences of what we're doing. Yeah, so, so, so what you're getting at is the jo job impact from AI. Yeah, and I, I think it's, a, that, that's a, it's an important area, right? I would say, one, I, I think there's, there's a lot of speculation around the job impact from AI. Um, and and I, I think we have to take it, we have to be thoughtful from a policy perspective because, uh, because it, it, there's a lot of, in my mind, there's a lot of variability. There's, there's areas where there's clear prototypes and work being done on things that can, can displace at least tasks, if not actual jobs. Uh, so, you know, you look at the amount of investment into, uh, for example, autonomous driving, right? I think that, that there's, there's, you know, good, good likelihood of certain job categories being significantly affected by AI in the next uh, few years. And so I think, you know, what, what's, what's, we have to be thinking about is, uh, as a society, we haven't done well at how do we, we retrain and sort of help affected communities with these kind of job displacements, right? I mean, you look at um, the diseases of despair, the deaths of despair, that is, um, in areas where uh, industrial production has really uh, declined in the U.S., and it's like we haven't done a good job of, of helping displaced workers from manufacturing jobs find good alternatives, right? And, and I think, you know, we're going to see more of that. I mean, I don't think it's always as simple, like, it's one thing to diagnose a, a, a condition, but, you know, my guess is that you're going to see a lot more augmentation of physicians um, and, and sort of higher, higher quality of care in medicine rather than automation of medicine in the near term. But I think you know there there's a lot of variability. I, I mean, I, I do worry on the one side that that, that you know the narrative like AI is going to take all the jobs is a little overhyped, and that you know there's people who will project out AI is going to replace jobs in a sector where no one has a working prototype of anything like that. And you know if you if you can't see a prototype of it, I don't 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 be skeptical that it's going to have a big impact in the next ten years, right? Because it still takes time to test and roll things out, right? How long have we been working? on self-driving cars. It's been about a decade, right? And so, you know, and we're still nowhere close to millions of robo-taxis on the road, regardless of the projections of certain uh, car company CEOs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I wish I could. I think generally, we've got the video, right? And so I think the video will be shared. Um, Google's policy is we don't like to share slides because we don't like them to be taken out of context of the presentation. But, the, but you know, I believe the video will be shared, right? So you'll have access to that. All right. Well, I don't want to run us too late. So thank you so much for your time and, and questions. <laughs>